ok. So, welcome to today's class. In the last class we discussed the basics of solid state NMR spectroscopy and how we are going to use that in structural biology. So, I introduce you um, the difference between solid state NMR and liquid state NMR spectroscopy and uh, what are the protein molecules that are applicable for solid state NMR where we can apply solid state NMR for looking at the structural and dynamics aspects of biological macromolecules. I also discuss about inherent problem with solid state NMR and what can be uh, toolkit for uh, getting some of these problem uh, overcoming some of those problem. So, let us repeat little bit and then we move forward. So, in the previous class I, I discussed that uh, we want to mimic the inherent averaging process that is in solution state NMR to obtain high resolution isotropic information ok. So, inherent averaging process in that is present in solid state NMR. If you do that, if we mimic that solution state like condition, then we can get the isotropic information and, and, and this to, to do that what we have to do? We have to enhance the resolution and sensitivity ok. So, how we are going to enhance the resolution and sensitivity? By removing the anisotropic part that were present in solid and retain only isotropic part. If you remove an isotropic part, retain only isotropic part by something called decoupling or averaging of interaction, then we can get a sharper line. But by doing this we are like a getting rid of important structural parameters. So, we have to introduce those, get back those in isotropic part for elucidation of geometric parameter um, like a dipolar coupling or chemical shift in isotropy. So, that is called recoupling or reintroducing this information. So, first we decouple to get sharper lines, then we recouple to get important structural geometric parameter. With doing this we can achieve best out of both world the sharper line which is generally seen in the solution state NMR and all the structural parameter that are present inherently present in, in the solids. So, if you do that we can achieve the structural aspects or dynamics motional aspects of protein molecules in solid state NMR. So, how to do it? Actually it all started when John Kendrew in 1958 proposed this idea of a spinning sample at, uh, at an angle which is called magic angle. So, you know this is our main magnetic field B0 right and in solution state we know that our sample tube was something like this right. So, all the spins were aligned like this. So, our spins were placed samples was placed along the magnetic field. Now, John Kendrew proposed since dipolar coupling is culprit, so can we do something? Can we orient our sample at an angle which is called a magic angle this theta m in the magnetic field and then th we spin them faster and faster and faster and faster. Because of this faster spinning the interactions that we talked will be averaged out ok. And this theta m is a magic angle, why this is magic angle? Because you know 3 cos square theta minus 1 is that dipolar coupling term and if you want to make it average, so we have to put it a 0. So, now you can calculate what will be our theta that will be 54.7 degree. So, if we orient our sample at that angle which is called magic angle, we are putting our sample in this rotor. This is the, the fins that are in the rotor and we have to spin with air faster, faster and faster and because of that actually this anisotropic interactions that is there will be averaged out ok. So, what are the samples where we are putting samples all sorts of samples whether it is membrane protein or fibril protein or aggregated protein any of these we pack in this rotor. That rotor is placed at an angle called magic angle in the magnet and then we are spinning and you see what happens because of this spinning here. So, if we spin it, 
if we just let me just remove this okay um just one minute i okay so because of this spinning at magic angle um, so let's say in a static case we have seen right the peaks were really really broad and i'm taking the simplest sam sample glycine where there are only two carbon one with ch2 that is alpha carbon and one carbonyl carbon co so for alpha carbon we are getting one peak here really broad peak here and then for co we are getting a really broad peak here that is for a static case if you are not spinning, it is a glycine the simplest biological molecule that you can think of amino acid. When we start spinning, so we are spinning speed is here say 0 0.85 kilohertz that is a um, kilohertz means like this many rotation per second, then lines starts becoming really like a little sharper and you can see now these uh, whatever we have discussed orientation dependence chemical shift is start appearing here. If we start little faster like a 3 kilohertz we see now lines are slowly getting sharper if we go to 5.5 kilohertz two lines are now really really become really have become sharp and if we go to 12 kilohertz we see only two peaks beautiful two peaks one coming here at the C alpha one coming here at the CO. So, glycines spinning at 12 kilohertz is giving us really sharp peak. So, we have to spin it you remember this 12 kilohertz means 12,000 rotation per second. So, this is quite fast spinning if you compare with your ultra centrifuge that is that is 1, 1 lakh rpm that is rotation per minute here we are talking 12,000 rotation per second. So, this is damn fast you have to spin that damn, damn fast. So, this material that is there that is made has to be really robust and the, the mechanical um, mechanical aspects also has to be very robust. So, these are spinned with air and that is that is given from outside and here are the pins and it has to spin very stably in a narrow passage. So, this is made up of zirconium oxide it is a really robust material because we are doing experiment at various temperatures. So, it should be temperature insensitive and it can spin really really fast. So, this is one of the moderate spin that we can think of 12 kilohertz it can nowadays can go up to 110 kilohertz and that that is a special arrangement that you need for spinning. But because of this spinning now we are going to get really sharp lines yeah. So, as we discussed if we have to spin it spin it very faster and this spinning is called magic angle spinning we are spinning our rotors at an angle which is called magic angle and this actually averaging out our anisotropic interactions. So, now we have a different kind of rotor because for depending upon samples we have to spin it at different speed and we have all the way like a, this is say 7 mm then 4 mm rotor. So, this is 7 mm means 7 millimeter is the outer diameter of the uh, of this rotor then 4 mm 3.2 mm 2.5 mm 1.3 mm or even like you can see now uh, nowadays we have a 0.8 mm rotor that is really really fast spinning rotor. So, here is a 3.2 mm and you need a nanogram of sample for doing solid state MR. just with a coin this are compared. So, if you reduce, reduce your outer diameter that means we can spin faster and faster. So, outer diameter of magic angle spinning rotors determine the maximum rotation frequency like if we are having 6 mm rotor that means we can spin maximum up to 8 kilohertz. If we have 4 millimeter rotor we can spin up to 15 kilohertz. If we have 2.5 mm rotor we can spin up to 30 kilohertz if you are going say 1.9 kilohertz uh, 1.9 millimeter of rotor we can spin up to 40 kilohertz 42 kilohertz and if you are spinning up to like 1.3 we can go all the way up to 65 to 70 kilohertz and now the, the fastest rotor the fastest available rotor is 0.8 mm 
that can go 100, 100 or 110 kilohertz. So, so now this different size of rotors are essential for spinning faster and faster. Now since we are miniaturizing this rotor size, so that means the sample that we can pack in this is also going to be very very small. The sample volume depends upon what is the inner uh, diameter of the rotor. What I talk to you is the outer diameter of the rotor. So if inner diameter if you talk that is going to be very small because this material has to be very stable that is why it is made up of zirconium oxide. Now these are two uh, this is the top cap which, which has a fins that, um, that drives the spinning. So essential volume that the like our, the effective volume that is there is very small for these smaller rotors right. So and the mass frequency also depends upon what is kind of, of the size so smaller size faster rotation bigger size slower rotation and that also determines what kind of experiment that we are going to implement. Here we can like since we are spinning fast so we can average out really lots of the stronger interaction and therefore we can do something called even proton detection that probably I am going to talk to you briefly. Here mostly we have to do carbon uh, detection. 3.2 rotor can spin up to 42 kilohertz and that has a speed of 240 meter per second when rolling along, uh, along the ground and that needs only 46 hours to roll around the whole earth that is the fastest that is the fastest I am talking. So we have to spin these rotors really really fast to average out the anisotropic interactions that we have talked about and because of this we are going to get basically the sharper lines that, that we have talked. So the powder pattern gives us broad line and, uh, and the side wind but we have if we are spinning faster then we can get a sharper line and this mass frequency is chosen so that we, we get out of this um, side band and then we can then once we get a sharper line then we can introduce some of the recoupling experiment that I had talked to you earlier ok. So how we do? So you remember we are doing two things, we are first decoupling the unwanted interaction and then selectively reducing uh, introducing the wanted interactions. So decoupling, so suppose here is one spin coupled with four spins, so here is a say rare spins uh, in red which is called which we can call it carbon 13 or N15 and that is surrounded by abundant spin protons. <coughs> so we have homonuclear dipolar coupling <coughs> between proton proton and we have heteronuclear dipolar coupling between carbon and proton. This is relatively weaker coupling and this is very like a quite a strong coupling. So if we spin faster and faster we can we can like a weaken this coupling. So if you look at the order of the dipolar coupling proton proton since the proton proton distance is shorter about 1.8 angstrom the coupling in terms of kilohertz is about 21 kilohertz. The carbon proton coupling the distance is 1.1 the here coupling is about 23 and another if the distance is like increasing up to 2 you have a weak coupling like 3.8. So depending upon what is the distance between these two dipoles your coupling also varies and because of this the mass we can weaken this coupling and then we can do something called decoupling. We, we like selectively irradiate these couplings by a series of pulses which is called decoupling pulses then we can get rid of this heteronuclear coupling. So because we are getting rid of this hetero, uh, heteronuclear coupling we are going to get a sharper line. So, so that is that is what we do in a typical experiment in heteronuclear decoupling experiment the first thing just to, to take you on track first thing we did magic angle spinning. We put our sample in this rotor we put that in, in the magnet at an angle which is called magic angle and then we are spinning faster and faster and faster depending upon what is our requirement all the way from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz that average out some of those heteronuclear couplings. 
Then next thing we are doing is dipolar decoupling. What we do in this dipolar decoupling? So we always start polarization from the proton which is I spin and then we transfer that we can transfer that on, on carbon typically that I am going to talk to you in the next slide. But in decoupling what we do? We selectively irradiate in decoupling this is the simple thing we irradiate the proton and we detect on carbon because of this irradiation constant uh, constantly irradiation on proton we can we are getting rid of these uh, the heteronuclear dipolar coupling. So, in this simple experiment what we are doing we are having two spin one proton one carbon proton is I spin carbon is, is S spin we are applying a 90 degree pulse detecting carbon while decoupling protons. So, S spin is detected and I spin is decoupled now this, this is what we get a sharper line. So, because of magic angle we are getting this weakened coupling because of irradiation we are removing this, this these couplings. So, and now this because of this RF application we have removed this coupling and therefore this is kind of a isolated spin which probably gives us which, which is going to give us better resolution. Okay. The next important parameter that is in solid state is called cross polarization. This is something like Hartmann-Hahn condition that we have discussed in liquid state. So, cross polarization is what you know the proton uh, the gyromagnetic ratio is high carbon it is 1 fourth that is more sensitive carbon is less sensitive. So, can we exploit that more sensitivity of proton for our benefit and for doing that what we do is called cross polarization. We are polarizing proton and, and carbon simultaneously and transferring that polarization from proton to carbon to enhance the sensitivity. So, how we do that? Let us start again with two spins, I spin and S spin. First, we are exciting protons using 90 degree here. So, now proton is excited. So, so um, this is like we apply X pulse, so it is in Y. Okay. Now, then we are simultaneously applying the, the RF on proton and carbon, and this is ramped actually, uh, ramped because of. Uh, because of it gives the stable performance at high mass. So, we are ramping here and then we are matching that Hartmann-Hahn condition. If you match that condition, now the polarization from proton is transferred to carbon. So, we have in, in, enhanced the sensitivity. Now, we will decouple the proton and detect on carbon. So, we did two things, we started with proton transfer our uh, transfer our magnetization to carbon using this cross polarization we decouple proton and then detected on carbon so because of this we are enhancing the sensitivity of carbon so so resolution was enhanced using magic angle spinning and decoupling and cross polarization is increasing the sensitivity so these two are basic building block for any solid state NMR experiment. <coughs> the cross polarization CP and magic angle spinning that is mass. So, what is the cross polarization condition? So, you have to have these delta omega nutation that is spinning frequency should match with the rotational frequency R or 2, two omega R. So, we are like having delta omega H minus delta omega carbon should be matching with our delta omega r in a spinning condition to have this Hartmann-Hahn um, magic angle condition. So, suppose we are spinning at say 10 kilohertz. So, difference between the frequency that is applied on proton and frequency applied on carbon. So, here is 10 kilohertz that should be either 10 or 20 or something like this. Uh, the, and then we can establish this Hartmann hand con condition and we can increase the sensitivity. Therefore, to conclude magic angle spinning, magic angle spinning is essential for getting the sharper line. Then it is supplemented by heteronuclear dipolar coupling. So, these two leads to resolution whereas cross polarization 
leads to sensitivity of the signal. So, CP and mass these two are basic block basic building block of any solid state NMR experiment. Yeah, so as we saw this we have to do X nuclei detection that is carbon or nitrogen while decoupling the proton this proton decoupling is removing the heteronuclear dipolar coupling. So, we have to apply a high power decoupling on proton that is going to be order of, of 100 kilohertz. Now, if we do that we are going to get a really sharp line. So, magic angle spinning remove anisotropic interactions and remaining was removed by this high power decoupling and then we are doing cross polarization to enhance the sensitivity. Now, we are almost achieving the liquid state like spectrum. So, for this L valine in L phenyl and if you look at here the liquid state spectrum shown in blue and solid state spectrum shown in red you are getting really really beautiful sharp lines almost comparable to liquid state. Now, we achieve it we wanted to always have a sharper line is not it. So, now we had a sharp line. So, what are the disadvantage of the solid state why we cannot do solid state for everything Dis disadvantage is now because of lower sensitivity um, and we are because we are detecting on carbon. So, that is a lower sensitivity to, to compensate that sensitivity we really need larger samples. So, we are putting about 30 to 40 milligram in 3 or 4 millimeter or 3.2 millimeter rotor to get such signals and we have to probably record little longer to achieve the same signal to noise ratio for in the solid state environment. So, these are some of the disadvantage, but still we can detect these, these uh, samples in their states what it should be and this is very much useful like I say for, say for, for, for pharma sample. Right. So, many of the medicine that we consume comes in a tablet right? and if you dissolve them then there is a possibility that that property will change. Now, we do not want to perturb anything just take that pack in the rotor record the spectrum and you see what kind of the molecular configuration and, and the orientation of these moieties are there in their formulated state. So, solid state NMR is a great boon if if we are doing that in the formulated state and still we are achieving very sharp lines. So, we can tell everything that is needed. Okay. So, advantage we are getting by doing this CP and mass is really high resolution. Now, we can see it almost compared to and we are getting all the peaks that are there uh, in the liquid state NMR. So, Pro, we detected on proton uh, sorry carbon can be detected on proton right proton detection because sensitivity was less for carbon. If we replace that carbon with proton we are going to get it better sensitivity. So, can we think of detecting now proton as well see proton the in inherent property that because of high dipolar coupling we have a really broad signal here ok you can see the broad signal. Now, if you are no mass, no decoupling, we are really getting broad signal. You can see how much it is dispersed. Now, we start spinning and still no decoupling, then we are start to see some feature, some resolution, and depending upon how fast we are spinning it. If we are spinning it, say 20 kilohertz, still there is a line broad, but if you go about 100 kilohertz we will start getting this sharp features and we, we apply mass magic angle spinning and then do proton proton decoupling then we are really going to get sharp lines. So, for proton detection you need damn fast magic angle spinning and high power decoupling for proton proton decoupling and still we can detect it still we can detect proton. So, we are not losing sensitivity. But you remember I, I just showed you the rotors that is used for fast spinning it is a 1.3 millimeter or 0.9 or 0.8 millimeter. Now, if rotor size is decreasing the OD I am talking about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or 1.3 the rotor size is decreasing the effective volume that you that, that is available for putting your sample is also reducing. So, you really need to put it small 
small amount of the sample inside the rotor. If we, we can, if we, uh, we are happy with that, if your problem is getting solved with that small nanogram of sample, you can still spin very faster, detect a well resolved spectrum using protons and you can get all the structural parameter. So, that gives you a little bit of perspective how we initiate our experiment using solid state NMR. Here onwards I will take a little bit of transition go because 1D is not good enough for structural biology you know right. So, we need to transition into 2D. So, how we are going to use 2 dimensional NMR spectroscopy for a structural elucidation of, of bio macro, biological macromolecules in the next class and I hope uh, you are getting along with me. So, I would uh, I would request you to go back and little bit read about the basics tools of solid state NMR and the next class we start with the two dimensional aspects of, of solid state NMR and how we can utilize those two dimensional spe, uh, spectrum for getting the structural information for biological macromolecule. Thank you very much. Let me stop it here today. Thank you.